uh, the Word of God together. And that passage is Matthew 25, verses 1 through 13. All right, so I'll begin. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. But the wise answered, saying, Since there will be not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. Afterward, the other virgins came also, saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay, Pastor William will give the message. Okay, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Okay. Um, Thank God for a successful uh, yard sale. Wow, that's, uh, that's like probably like 10 times more uh, revenue than I was thinking that was going to happen. So <laughs> praise God. <laughs> it's a very wor- uh, worthwhile endeavor. And, th- and thank God for um, the spirit of God that really uh, encouraged Jason to put this on and really lead this. And so thank God for his him and his family's labor of love and all the other people who um, worked very hard for this. So uh, what a glorious, uh, you know, result. So today's uh, message is called The Wise and Foolish Virgins. Um, The key verse is, uh, we're going to focus on verse 13 as the key verse. There's a lot of key verses in these these 13 verses, but I think 13 is probably the most important. So let's go ahead and read it. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. So verse 13 is the conclusion of our passage today. And as you can tell, this is a warning verse. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. What do we need to watch out for? Today, we're going to watch out for a very essential and critical issue. And we're going to learn about what to watch out for through Jesus' parable of 10 virgins. Now, in today's passage, uh, there's 10 virgins that are mentioned, but five are foolish and five are wise. And today's passage is we're going to talk a lot about uh, and understand the relationship that oil had to do with these five foolish and five wise virgins And also, we're going to learn a lot about the importance of a flame. So with that, let's uh, go ahead and pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with this time that we can uh, gather together in Jesus' name. Thank you so much for all the amazing work that you've done uh, throughout history, and most importantly, by bringing your uh, one and only son to this world to uh, really minister to us and to die on a cross and to also um, really uh, be resurrected. Uh, We just uh, ask you that you would please um, uh, be with us as we go through this passage uh, from the beginning to the end, and we pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's start by looking at verses 1 through 4. Let's uh, read verses 1 through 4 responsibly. I'll go first. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. So verse 1 starts off with, The kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. To understand the premise of Jesus' parable, we have to understand a little bit more about Jewish weddings because they're a lot different than American weddings. 
So let me kind of just uh, uh, break this down a little bit because um, fundamentally, American weddings are about the big wedding day, right? The big day. We even call it that, you know, the, your big day. But Jewish weddings are a little bit more drawn out than American weddings. So let me explain. So um, a Jewish wedding begins with a very important moment, of, uh, even a uh, small ceremony, of a marriage vow, a vow, a devotion, a, a proclamation that we are going to be married between a uh, bride and a bridegroom. Now, we would usually think that, that, oh, that's their wedding day. Not the case. This is the day of making a pledge to be married. We can see this is the case with Joseph and Mary, as we studied a while ago in Matthew's gospel, when uh, Joseph was pledged to be married to Mary, but they had not consummated their, their marriage. So they weren't, they were uh, pledged, which is basically like you're going to get married. It's not like, oh, well, I might want to back out a little bit. No, you're pledged. You're ready to go. But you just haven't fully consummated the, the marriage and enjoyed a wedding feast together. So Jewish weddings begin with a very sincere, important marriage vow. And then it goes on and it takes a very interesting turn. For example, then uh, the, the bride and the bridegroom actually split up. What? <laughs> the groom leaves to prepare a place for his bride. And the bride stays and prepares herself for the final marriage ceremony, uh, which is uh, really about the marriage feast. So what is the bride doing uh, during this time? She's uh, preparing her dress oftentimes. She's collecting fine linen and putting together her wedding dress. You know, you think that she, maybe during the marriage vows, she was dressed in her beautiful uh, wedding dress. Not the case. So the bridegroom leaves to go pre pre prepare a place. He's, you know, building a home for his bride. And then some indefinite amount of time passes by. It's not clear. Is it going to be 10 days, 20 days, 30 days? It's not clear. You know, obviously back then they didn't have cell phone communications where, you know, the... the the groom could call and say, oh, the, the house is about 30% done. I think I'll be there in about like maybe uh, eight more days. You know, that didn't even happen. So the bride, while her groom was off preparing a place, she would be busy preparing herself, especially her wedding dress of fine linen. And during this time, her uh, bridesmaids, unmarried women, virgins, who also really were into marriage and weddings, you know, very excited. They would help the bride prepare her wedding dress, for example. So then finally, sometime, there would be a call that would go out, oftentimes in the evening, in, in, in nighttime. And somebody would uh, blow a, a, a chauffeur, I think, or I think that's how you say it, the, the horn, the Jewish ram horn, and say, the groom is arriving. And then the groom would return for his bride. And he would be really excited. And the, and the, and the uh, bride would be very excited. Finally, they're back together again. And then they would proceed to go into the wedding feast and consummate their marriage and be married you know, finally, the, the whole, the whole uh, uh, marriage would be finalized and completed, the whole cycle. Now, the virgins, of course, they, you know, were working so hard and had, had uh, prepare, helped the bride prepare. And they also wanted to go into the wedding feast. And they also would be invited to the wedding feast. And then, you know, the bride and the groom would go off happily ever after again. So... But in today's passage, not all 10 of the bridegrooms or the bridesmaids or virgins go into, the, into the, uh, the wedding feast. Only five do. And I think that that's actually one of the um, sort of concerns that maybe if you're a, a Jewish listener, you'd be like, wow, that's really a bad thing. That's a very sad thing to hear. And that's an important premise because this passage is indeed a warning. 
So then the kingdom of heaven will be like ten virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. This idea of who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. You know, the bride, of course, would have to get herself ready. But the, the job of the, of the, of the uh, virgins or bridesmaids is that they, when the groom came, they would take their lamps and they would then go out to meet the bridegroom with their lamps burning. And if their lamps were burning, they would properly welcome the bridegroom, properly. If that flame was burning in their lamps when they came, it was a proper, fitting way to welcome the bridegroom. And with that proper welcome, they were then brought into the wedding feast. Now, let's, uh, today's passage, we're going to talk a lot about lamps, a lot. But um, I want to kind of maybe zoom in, zoom out a little bit, and let's think about vessels in general, not just lamps. For example, here's uh, three vessels. Uh, you know, they probably are very recognizable. Maybe the silver one, uh, maybe you're like, is that a cereal bowl or something? But So, you know, the wine glass, of course, is for what? Wine. What is this? Fish bowl is for what? Fish. And a dog bowl is for what? Dog food. Right, right, exactly. Now, I want to um, share with you all a, uh, a vessel that, um, that today's passage talks about. So today's a little bit interactive, more, a little bit more interactive than normal. So uh, give me one second here. Okay, so how am I gonna? What is that? Uh, yeah, this got kind of tossed over <laughs> a little bit. Yeah, thanks. Okay, perfect. Thank you so much, Isaiah. Very helpful. Okay, we'll put that down there. Okay, so. This here, I'm gonna use this one because I use this one a lot. This here is a lamp. All right? It looks, oh, that's, that's, that's so cute, right? Uh, well, this is, this, is a, this is the certificate of authenticity that came with this lamp. <laughs> if, you, if you read it here with me, it says, this, uh, you know, kind of going to the middle text, this genuine handmade biblical clay oil lamp replica was created from designs found in archaeological digs in the Holy Land. And then they actually quote today's passage. I was so surprised. Then shall the kingdom of heaven be like unto ten virgins which took their lamps and went forth to meet the bridegroom. The reason why I brought this, and I want to show you how it works, is because this lamp is the kind of lamp that was super common, this size, that was super common throughout Jesus' time. You remember the, uh, his teaching, no one takes a lamp and puts a bowl on top of it, right, or puts it underneath the bed? I think if you're like me, I always like wondered, like, man, did they have some like really big bowls? Because how do you put a lamp under a bowl? Right, because I, I was thinking more in terms of like lanterns and like la larger like lamps. But this is the kind of lamps that Jesus is talking about. These are very common uh, throughout Israel. Um, they would, and actually the whole Roman world. Um, of course, they would have different, uh, you know, kind of uh, ways that you could construct it. But basically, you know, even the most simple ones like this, you put a wick inside of it, you put some oil, and you light it, and then that's your lamp. Other vessels could be very fancy. But fundamentally, it just needed to, you know, just hold the oil and then, of course, would burn. So I want to I wanna demonstrate to you, everyone, how this, how this works. And then hopefully I can uh, pass these around a little bit. So you have here a, uh, a, a vessel. And what, does anyone know what this is? What kind of oil? Yes, olive oil. Very Extra version. <laughs> Indeed. <laughs> a 
Okay. So, I just filled up the, 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 lamp, the lamp with a, a little bit of extra virgin olive oil. And then this is a wick here from uh, Israel, as they said. So I'm going to put this inside here. And I'm going to kind of spin it around because you need the wick to get uh, a lot of oil on it. Now, I got to tell you, in preparation for this uh, passage, I actually bought these a week ago. And I, I did my best to try to actually burn this lamp that I'm holding right now continually for a week. I didn't make it the full week. It went out several times because I, I didn't pay attention to it all the time. But... It was very interesting to try to keep a lamp like this burning continually. And I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. So um, here's, here it is. I'm going to... And what's amazing is that this is going to catch on fire in a second. It actually lights a little bit better if the wick is um, a little bit used. Okay, I think we're good. All right, great. So this will keep burning, and the oil will keep on floating up into the wick, and then this thing will just keep going like this. So Isaiah, can you come and grab this, and we can pass it around? Don't be afraid to pass this around. If you get scared, you don't have to pass it around, but, but I want everyone to kind of get a sense. Can I hold it from the bottom? Yeah, yeah, you, no? you can hold it from the bottom. <laughs> I'm going to get a couple more going here so we can pass them around. <laughs> Does somebody want to come up and help light this one? All right, Moses, good job. Thanks. All right, you can light that one. Yeah, go ahead and hold, hold it, yeah. And then take it over there and start passing around over there. Okay. I need another volunteer. Who else wants to volunteer? Octavio, come on up here. And then Alex, too. You guys work together. All right, you're going to hold this, and Alex is going to pour it, pour it in. That's good right there, yeah. And then pull out the wick, and then flip it around, and then put it back in so you get, like, the, yeah. Oh, yeah, there it is. There you go. Okay. And then go ahead and light that one and put it. Make sure you can let everyone see how to do it. There you go. It takes a little while. Yeah, you have to, you have to get used to getting your hands a little oily. You can't be afraid. Okay, now put now, you, now see what's interesting is if you keep the wick out that far, it's gonna burn too fast. So you gotta pull it in a little bit. There you go. All right, now, uh, pass that one around. Go to the middle, yeah. Give me Andrew Cravis. You can take it. Okay, and uh, maybe Juan, as they get to the back of the room, Juan, can you collect them? And then you can, uh, let's keep them burning. Okay, great, yeah. So I learned a lot when I actually got these lamps and then put them together and started them burning and kept them burning, and it really gave me a lot of insight into this passage and really what can be at the heart of, of this. Because fundamentally, since we're talking about vessels, uh, the human heart is a vessel. In our heart, we're like this, uh, this lamp that can hold something. Now, within our heart, we can hold a lot of different things. We can hold money. We can hold desires for material things. We can have in our heart worries. 
our heart can be filled up with all kinds of stuff because the human heart is a vessel. But in today's passage, we're going to also learn about oil and how our heart is like a lamp that should have oil in it, not something else. <laughs> All right, so that means I got to get going on this message. Okay, so, so let, let's think a little bit about oil. Um, no, it's okay, it's all right. Thank you. So oil, oil is the electricity of the ancient world. I think that's a very important concept to understand. You know, we use extra virgin olive oil for cooking primarily. But in the ancient world, it was primarily used for fire, for lanterns and lamps and also even torches. Now, I got I to tell you, I went a little bit crazy. I actually... Uh, all three of these pictures. So uh, this picture on the, on the left is a picture of the, the lamp that I, I bought. The middle one is a picture of, of a menorah that I own that I also put oil in. I usually put candles in that, but I'm like, I don't think the menorah had candles. I think it had oil, olive oil in it. In fact, I know it did. And then lastly, there's a lot of places in the Bible that talk about torches. So one night about like really late, William and I, uh, I took an old t-shirt and wrapped it around a stick and then dunked that in olive oil and lit it on fire. And it was amazing. It was a torch just like you see in the movies. Like you could like <laughs> go like this. Like you could see it was, it was just like that picture. And one of the uh, really amazing things I learned about this, this relationship is that the t-shirt really acts like the wick. And one of the things you'll notice about if you, if you use these lamps is that the oil protects the wick from burning too much. If there's no oil in the wick or no oil in, in the t-shirt on this torch, it will burn up right away. But the oil is actually, when it's soaked in the oil, the oil ends up being the thing that gets burned. So it's very, very interesting uh, how this works. Oil. The importance of oil and how oil was the electricity of the ancient world. So let's go back to the passage real quick. Then the kingdom of heaven will be like uh, 10 virgins who took their lamps and went to meet the bridegroom. So in this case, we have a bride that's obviously in this passage, but not specifically mentioned. The focus is mostly on the 10 virgins. And on a macro level, the bride obviously represents the, the, um, the church the high level of the church. But these 10 virgins really represent the micro level of individuals and even smaller groups of people and how their state is. So the bride is definitely going into the wedding feast, no problem. But today's passage, Jesus really helps us to understand and appreciate the relationship of the 10 virgins and the condition of their lamp. That's what today's passage is really focusing on, is on the more uh, micro level of understanding the, the virgins, their relationship with the, their lamps, and how that impacts their ability to partake in the wedding feast. So Jesus says here in verse 2, five of them were foolish and five were wise. Now on the, on the surface level, the ten virgins, they all had a sense of purity. They were all virgins, right? And they all had intentions to join the wedding feast. But Jesus says that even though they look exactly the same and had the same desire and all were you know, virgins and, and dedicated to purity, five of them were foolish and five were wise. So there was a distinction and there was under the surface a big difference between them. So we gotta ask ourselves the question then, how were they foolish or how were they wise? Verse 3, for when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them, but the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. So once again, all were very similar, but Jesus says that five were foolish and five were wise because their mentality 
about their lamp was different. What do I mean by this? Jesus says that the five foolish ones did not take oil, but the five wise ones took flasks of oil. A big, you know, that's not a flask, it's a bottle, but you get the point. They brought a lot of extra oil with them when they went out. What Jesus is really saying here is that five of the foolish versions had a casual attitude about their lamps, where five of the wise had a very serious attitude. Do you see that? Five had a casual attitude and said to themselves, I'll be fine, everything will work out. I'm just gonna take my lamp, and obviously their lamp had oil in it, you know, some amount. Whereas the serious, wise version said, I need to make sure my lamp is burning. It has to be burning. And so as a result, they took with them extra oil to make sure that their lamp did not go out and that that flame would be burning bright when the bridegroom came back. For when the foolish took their lamps, they took no oil with them. Not serious. But the wise took flasks of oil with their lamps. They were not going to let their lamps go out. They were going to make sure that that flame was burning bright for when the bridegroom came. And they would therefore welcome him properly. So, again, how were the foolish? How were they foolish or how were they wise? The wise understood understand the importance of their lamp to greet the bridegroom. They know that if this thing is burning, I'm going to have a connection with him. And they know that if, it, if my lamp is out, it's going to break my connection with him. And the wise understand the role of their lamp to join the wedding feast. If, I, if my lamp is burning bright, I'm going to be able to join that wedding feast. But if my lamp is out, I will not be able to join that wedding feast. So fundamentally, the wise ensure that their lamps don't go out. Let's look at verses 5 through 9. Let's uh, uh, read uh, verse uh, 5 and 6 here together. Okay, let's go. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. Now, obviously, the five wise uh, uh, were not um, perfect. <laughs> Both uh, groups, all 10 of the virgins, you know, were uh, waiting because the bridegroom was not coming at the time that everyone thought he was going to come. He was delayed, as it says in verse 5. As the bridegroom was delayed, they all became drowsy and slept. But at, mid at midnight, there was a cry. Here is the bridegroom. Come out to meet him. God's grace to wake them up. But the problem of the foolish still persisted. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps, and the foolish said to the wise, Give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Here we learn an important lesson, and that is that lamps burn oil. At one time, the foolish had a lamp that was burning. They, they took that lit lamp, all 10 of them, and the foolish ones was burning at one time. And, but the thing is that the bridegroom didn't come while their lamp was burning. He was delayed. And so then they maybe all sat down, and then as, as they sat down, their lamps kept burning, and then they fell asleep, and then they all, all their lamps went out. I got to tell you, I know, I know exactly. I, I actually, let me say this. I want to encourage everyone to go on Amazon and buy that lamp. It's you, you, and, and, and try to keep a lamp burning for a long period of time. You'll, you'll, you'll find out really quickly that, especially overnight, when you fall asleep, the lamp keeps on burning. And that oil goes down, 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 down. And then a crazy thing happens. This is surprising. 
if you get to the end of the, your oil in the lamp, the wick still has some oil in it. And then, but once that wick dries up from all the oil being used in it, the wick burns down super quick. So these wicks are pretty long, you know, and, but you, if you let your lamp burn and then, and then you wake up the next morning, there's like nothing in there anymore. The wick's gone, the oil's gone. It's just an empty vessel. So this tells us an important lesson. Oil runs down. You can be filled with oil in your lamp at one time, and it can be burning so bright and so perfect. But oil runs down and needs to be continually replenished inside of a lamp. And if it's not, that lamp becomes just an empty vessel with no real, it's not really doing anything. The value is, you know, it's just a vessel. I didn't have a chance to talk about it with the, with earlier, but if you think about it, a vessel's value really comes when, they, when it's filled with the right contents that, it, that it's created for. You know, a fishbowl, I mean, it like, looks interesting, but a fishbowl's real value, the, that vessel, its value really comes when it has a fish in it, right? It's the same thing with a lamp. When a lamp is filled with oil and is burning with a wonderful flame, then it has real value and its purpose is made complete. But without it, it's just, just a piece of, of clay. So, which reminds us of Genesis, if, if you caught that, you know, God made man from the, from the, from the dirt, uh, from the earth, and then kind of formed him together, like took some dirt and formed him together, and then did what? breathed into him the breath of life, filled him with Ruach, the breath of God. So just, okay, let's do a little, uh, this is going to be fun. I want everyone to take a deep breath real quick. Okay, let's go. One, two, three. Okay, now you got to take another breath. You get filled, and then you need to get another filling, and then another God created us, even just in our physical body, to be filled with him, with his, with his breath in our physical way and with his spirit in our heart. We are vessels of God. Acts chapter 2 tells us the same story. Let me uh, read uh, Acts chapter 2 real quick here, just a couple of verses. When the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind. And it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Wind came like ruach, breath came into the house. And divided tongues as a fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. This is uh, the event known as uh, the coming of the Holy Spirit. Now, I got to tell you, there's two things that, that I was like eye-opening revelations. This Acts chapter 2, I always wondered, Lord, what, why did you send tongues of fire? Like, what is, what is the tongue of fire? And then I actually learned the lamp and the fire that comes off of it that is shaped kind of like a tongue, that's called um, the, the, the tongue of the lamp or the, the, um, the flame, the tongue of the, the flame's tongue. If you think about it, and this picture is a good, a good illustration of it, what do, the, what do the believers look like? It starts with an L. They look like lamps, right? When they were filled with the Holy Spirit, tongues of fire appeared and rested on them. They became living lamps, shining bright with tongues of fire that spoke the word of God. 
Acts chapter 2. But the interesting thing is that if you just go forward just two chapters, maybe a couple weeks after Acts chapter 2. I don't know exactly, but it wasn't long. I know that. Acts chapter 4 says, and this is um, Peter praying, And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. And when they had prayed, the place in which they were gathered together was shaken, and they were all, say it with me, filled with the Holy Spirit and continued to speak the word of God with boldness. Once again, oil runs down. Oil, fresh filling of the Holy Spirit, which is this oil, is a continual work for a believer. In Acts chapter 2, they were filled with the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 4, they were filled again with the Holy Spirit. Oil runs down and needs to be replenished. Verse 7 and 8, let me read it for us. Then all those virgins rose and trimmed their lamps. I think that their wicks uh, had gone down, (laughs) so they needed to put new wicks in. Uh, And the foolish said to the wise, give us some of your oil, for our lamps are going out. Then verse 9 says, but the wise answered, saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. So obviously in, in, this, in these verses, the foolish realize, uh-oh, I'm in big trouble. I don't have enough oil. I don't have any oil. And so then the, they ask the wise if they could have some of their oil, but the wise are like, no, there's not going to be enough for us. This kind of shows us that it's a very individual, um, being, having enough oil is a very individual endeavor. But the wise answer saying, since there will not be enough for us and for you, go rather to the dealers and buy for yourselves. So I think one thing that a lot of people, uh, including myself, ask is, who are the dealers of oil? The dealers of oil, in my opinion, are people like Zechariah, the prophet, or Isaiah, the prophet. Basically, the prophets, Moses, and we could say in, in uh, modern times, like after, in the New Testament era, the writings of Paul, uh, John, Peter, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The dealers of oil are the people that God uses to talk and to disclose and reveal who Christ is. For, in, for instance, Zechariah chapter 4 has this really interesting vision of Zechariah of two olive trees that are pouring out olive oil into a bowl, which then is feeding the flames of seven, uh, seven lamps. Let me read us some of this. I'll explain it. And the angel who talked with me came again and woke me like a man who is awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, what do you see? I said, and this is Zechariah, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold with a bowl on the top of it. And seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on the top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the the right of the bowl and the other on its left. So Zechariah had a vision, an amazing vision, of um, these two olive trees that were pouring out oil. What are these olive trees? Zechariah actually asked, uh, I think it was at least two times to the angel, what are these trees all about? It's kind of a mystery. These trees actually are very important concepts and ones that we actually are very familiar with. One tree is the priesthood of Jesus. The second tree is the kingship of Jesus. And one way to kind of think about these trees that are giving out olive oil is is how the priesthood of Jesus, also known as the cross of Jesus, where as our high priest, he made atonement for us. And the kingship of Jesus, his resurrection, his victory for us as our king. These are the two olive trees with which much oil 
for the Christian believer pours forth from. The Holy Spirit, as we read the prophecies, the words of God, Old Testament, New Testament, doesn't matter. But they both lead us all the time to these two olive trees that pour forth oil. Jesus' cross, the atonement as our high priest dying for our sins and allowing us to be crucified with Christ so that we no longer live, but Christ Jesus lives in us. And Jesus' resurrection, his final victory over all evil and over all enemies of God. These two trees the Holy Spirit uses to pour oil into our hearts so that our hearts might be aflame for the living God and so that we can live powerful Christian lives through Jesus These are the dealers of oil. In Jesus' time, there was many dealers of oil, but obviously, you know, the oil was so prevalent at that time that uh, maybe in comparison, uh, oil dealers were as common as, as gas stations today. You know, it wasn't hard to find one, you know, because it was the electricity of the ancient world. So there was lots of people, there was lots of demand, and so there was lots of dealers. It's not hard to find a dealer, especially of in the word of God. But let's look at verses 10 through 13. Let's read these verses responsibly. I'll go first. And while they were going to buy, the bridegroom came, and those who were ready went in with him to the marriage feast, and the door was shut. But he answered, Truly I say to you, I do not know you. So unfortunately, the, um, the, bri- the, uh, the, five foolish, the five foolish virgins tried to find quickly a, a dealer of oil, but it was fundamentally a problem that had started a long time ago. It was a problem that started when they first thought about going out to meet the bridegroom, that they didn't really take seriously the need to keep that flame burning in their lamps. And so because they were just casual about it, thinking that everything was going to work out okay, they didn't really think too much about oil in their lives and and in their journey to go meet the bridegroom. And as a result, when it came time to have a burning flame, to have that flame burning bright, hot and bright, that love, that light, they were too late. Their foolishness had caught up with them. At the beginning, you couldn't distinguish it from the foolish and the wise. But in the end, their foolishness, their casualness caught up with them. It says here that um, afterwards, it says here afterwards, the other virgins, the, the wise ones, came also. Oh, sorry, these are, the, these are still the foolish ones. Sorry about that. Afterwards, the other virgins came also saying, Lord, Lord, open to us. But he answered, truly I say to you, I do not know you. So I think actually I kind of swapped the two verses together in my mind. I'm, I apologize. I'm still human. Um, let's think real fast. We're almost done. Let's think about the, the, uh, the ones that were ready when they went in to the marriage feast. What did, they, what did they understand? I think this is so beautiful. They understood the need to union their lamp with a wick and an olive oil to create a flame. See, these three things, the oil, the wick, and the, and, the, and the vessel, they come together, and they create something that wasn't there to begin with. You know, I think there's, there's, there's two things that are, that are material, materially um, ephemeral, which means, like, you can't, 
Okay, uh, let me back up. So a flame. Can you can you dig in a cave and find a flame? Can you uh, you know open a box and you know find a, a bunch of flames? You know, can you go? <laughs> the point is, is that a flame is very is materially very transient. It, it exists when you bring together certain things, and then that flame exists. Very interesting uh, truth there. But when you bring together the right things in the right way, out comes this flame. And there's no other example uh, that describes God more than fire throughout the Bible. It's it's the most common way that God is referred to and his characteristics are, are expressed to us. So we see in the last verses here, Jesus says, very, uh, very much to us, watch therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. This is basically saying, keep your flame burning. Keep your lamps filled with oil and understand how important an oil is to you as a vessel of God. Personally, um, and in conclusion, I wanted to share my, my, what I learned from this. I have to tell you in all honesty, God drove his word deep into my heart through this passage. I saw through this passage that I was like a foolish virgin in the sense that I didn't comprehend deeply how I have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. I was just sort of like, if God fills me, great, but I got things to do and... But I learned from this passage that a wise believer really understands I have to have oil in me because I have to have a flame burning for God. And as I reflected on my 26 years of being a Christian, I could see like in the timeline here I was burning, and then I went down, and no oil, and then I felt lit up again, and then went down, lit up again. And I could see that what was my main problem was I didn't have the wisdom to really think in terms of this passage. I can't not have oil. I didn't have that like mentality. But this passage really encouraged me, and God really opened my eyes that As a believer, we have to stay filled with oil. We have to keep coming back to Jesus, to these two mighty trees, his cross and his resurrection, and fill our hearts with the oil of God, which then ignites this flame that welcomes Jesus and is a light to this world. So may God uh, bless us all to meditate on this passage deeply and think about, what am I filled with? Am I filled with oil? Am I filled with, uh, I actually, I was going to do this. I was going to bring some like pennies and dimes and put them inside of the vessel, inside the lamp, and then jiggle it around like a piggy bank. But, you know, there was times where I was very concerned about money. I was thinking, I was reflecting on those times where I didn't have the fire, and I'm like, yeah, I was just filled with with change. I was thinking about money too much. And there was other times I was filled with with garbage. I was like a trash can, right? But we shouldn't be filled with trash and be a trash can. We should be filled with oil and be God's lampstands or his lamps. So that's today's passage. Um, Let's read the key verse one last time. Okay, let's go. Watch, therefore, for you know neither the day nor the hour. Okay, let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for blessing us with this um, parable of the ten virgins and uh, helping us to understand the deep truths of this lamp, the oil, the flame, the tongue of flames uh, that came at Pentecost and these two wonderful trees of oil, Jesus' cross and his resurrection. Lord, help us to spend time with you. Help us to give you our attention so that we can pull oil from these two trees and be filled with your spirit and have a flame that's burning bright that really can welcome Jesus. And uh, uh, Lord, we just really thank you so much for the wisdom that this passage gives us. And 
May this whole church be filled with many people with their lamps burning bright, that we might be a city on a hill that cannot be hidden, that is uh, shining in the darkness and is a beacon of light for all lost souls. Um, thank you so much for your Holy Spirit. Help us to know we need the Holy Spirit, Lord. Many times we let the Spirit run dry in our hearts and we just kept living day after day with a dry, empty heart. Help us to repent of having dry, empty hearts. Help us to come to Jesus personally, intimately, deeply, and be refilled again with the oil of your spirit and that we might be burning bright for you to welcome Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.